each summer, at the end of the summer program, we have a keynote speaker, someone that just brings in encouraging words. And um, different summers, we've had different individuals, such as the deans, um, the provost. But this summer, there was someone I think that you really love to hear. And we are really fortunate to have him come back to say a few words for us. And that's our doctor. <laughs>
Okay, you all have more things to deal with than any generation before you. Tweeting, texting, Facebook, MySpace, uh -oh, technology, all this stuff. You're the first generation that, we didn't have cell phones when I was your age. Literally. Unless, how many people saw Wall Street? The movie, the old one? Mike and Doug's walking through the park. We had a big cell phone, it's like a brick. That's what we had. You grew up with this. This is part of your normal life. Don't be distracted by it. Okay? So the first piece about your phone, it can get it, it symbolizes a call that may be in your life. Don't miss your call. Now, if you don't want other people to hear your phone, what mode can you put it in? Silent or vibrate. So what does vibrate mean? Vibrate is that silent call. Vibrate is the phone is in your pocket. It vibrates, no one else hears it but you. The vibration is that still small voice, call it the Holy Spirit, call it your conscience, whatever you want to call it. Many of you, when you know you're doing wrong, it's something like, man, I shouldn't be doing this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah, that's the vibration. You know it, you hear it, it's small, and it's usually outweighed by all the distractions, but it's still there. Right? So the vibration for you symbolizes listening to that inner voice, listening to what you're supposed to do. So my notes are here on my phone. These are my powers for good. Okay, so we have, uh, what else can your phone do as a uh, feature? How many of your phones can take pictures? Oh, yeah. Right. Cool, you know, nice feature. Photos. What do photos represent? Memories. Absolutely. You need to remember. What do I mean by that? Many of you all may have come from privileged backgrounds, right? Where your family had money and you went to Jack and Jill and had plenty of opportunities. And that's great and that's wonderful, right? So part of what you need to remember is the sacrifices that your parents made for you to have those opportunities, which many of us take for granted. I, I began to appreciate my parents much more when I became a parent. Right now, we're looking at a school for my baby girl, three years old. It's a trilingual school. She learned how to speak English, Chinese, and Spanish fluently by the eighth grade because she starts now. School costs about $14,000 a year. So, and she's three. Right, exactly. 14 G's for a three year old. That's crazy, right? I, I, right, I hear you. But part of it is the investment. If we invest on the front end by eighth grade, she'll get a scholarship to any private high school she wants to go to. She'll get a scholarship to any college she wants to go to. At eighth grade, speaking three languages fluently and having high, high aptitude, she can write her own ticket. It requires us to sacrifice now. Now I begin to think my parents, who sent us to Catholic school, three boys in New York. I'm like, man, they must have been paying like for real. And then I remember my dad actually worked three jobs, pretty consistent. I just took it for granted I was in Catholic school. So you all need to remember what they sacrificed for you. Some of you may not have had those sort of uh, privileged backgrounds. Some of y'all, your families may have had to scrap to put things together. So you need to remember those people who said, I love you and I believe in you. Yeah, big mama sitting there, she may have dropped out of high school, but she believe in you. That lady at the church that give you a dollar or two dollars, say, hey, go to more house and show them something. They believe in you. You need to remember those people, even if you don't come from privilege. It's not just about you. Remember the people who shaped you, that teacher, that coach, that minister, whoever it was. You didn't get here because of you. If you think that, you need to sit down and talk much longer. Right? So the photo, the remember, the remembrance. Now also, you want to keep that down. Alright, now also in terms of the memory, you need to remember times when you have succeeded, when you beat the odds. If any of you have had an experience or done something that other people said you couldn't do or were surprised that you were able to do, you might have an experience. You need to cement that in your memory. Why is that? Because at Morehouse, in this place, you will be challenged. And you're going to have some nights where you're like, man, I don't know if I can do this. For real. And then you need to remember, well, I had a challenge like this before, and I overcame it. One of the best predictors of future behavior is past behavior. Now here's the rub. If you were a slacker in high school and just got by because of your natural ability, that will not work here. I said that before. So that past behavior, you need to let it go. You've learned nothing this summer. You learned that college is a little different from high school. Anybody learn that? Is that it's kind of different, right? You kind of got to go to class. And you kind of got to pay attention. And you kind of, to do well, need to read and think about things outside of class, to do well. That's what college is. OK, so in terms of the memory piece, your photo, you need to remember that piece in terms of your parents, your loved ones, and what they've done for you. Now, 
texting. <laughs> a very popular feature on the phone. So throw out some numbers. I did this before. But if you added up the total number of texts that you send and receive in any given day, give, throw out some numbers. How many? Add them up. Seven, eight hundred. Three thousand one day. Okay. You text? Yes. You'll text? Alright, there we go. Yes. Thousand. Six, seven hundred. Seventy. What? Five hundred. Seventy. You text? Yeah. But change. Oh yeah. About how many? Hundred? Okay, so let's think about the nature of our text, right? We talked about this before. So in terms of the content of the text that you send and receive, how many emergency text messages do you send or receive per day? Two. Emergency. Somebody got shot, somebody broke to the house. Uh, emergency, right? Very little. So we know the content of the text message is not that groundbreaking. However, you as an individual are sending and receiving messages all the time. What do I mean? How you present yourself. I've talked about this before. You send message with how you present. Are you well dressed, well read, well spoken, well traveled, well balanced? Five wells. Have you all heard that yet? Okay. Submit that in. So when I see you, when I look at you, do I see that? Are you sending that message? Okay. Or do I hear you cursing, using slang? I know you have to turn it on and off. Like as soon as y'all literally walk in the hallway outside this building with each other, switch turns and the language changes like that, right? But remember, you're still being watched. You're still within earshot of other people. So what messages are you sending? Also, what messages are you sending in terms of your time and money? So what message do you send? If you meet somebody and he tends to spend his money on books and you meet somebody else who tends to spend their money on video games, what's the different message for those two people? Right. I mean, it's, it's pretty straightforward. So as you spend your money, do you spend your money on fried chicken or chicken salad? So we go out to eat, and this might happen. When I go out to eat and somebody orders something healthy, I actually feel bad when I order fried chicken all of a sudden. I'm like, I can't get chicken salad. I know I should eat right. And they put it in your plate. All right, let me get chicken salad too. You know, but the thing is, what message are you sending? That person is telling me, regardless of what you all are ordering, I'm doing me. Here's the difference. Here's a little nugget for you. Take this with you. Y'all can use it, but just give me a shot at it. What's the difference between a thermostat and a thermometer? tell you. A thermometer, thermometer, measures heat, measures temperature. The thermometer tells you the temperature in a room, right? Thermometer. A thermostat controls the temperature in the room. So are you a thermometer or a thermostat? When you walk amongst your group of friends, are you a thermometer where you adjust to where they are, right? You just reflect the group. You are a follower. Or are you the thermostat? The thermostat walks into the room, and the room changes to adjust to the thermostat. Right? So the notion is, appreciate that. <laughs> what matter of man are you? Are you the, thermo the thermometer, follower, thermostat, leader? So a friend of mine, my line brothers, out of California, I got five line brothers from California. So we go out there, and so, you know, you know these are Morehouse cats, and, you know, some of their language is not the cleanest all the time, and they may use you know, the H word to refer to women. And so I'm there, whatever, and I, I was just coming in, this was like two years ago. He's like, oh no, we can't talk about black women like that, Brian's here. And he's like, well, forget that, we can talk about it. <laughs> he had to think twice, but the notion was, my presence changed the temperature. That's how your brand needs to be. When you walk into the room, people are like, well, we can't be talking about that around him. We can't do that around him, because he's not like that. Or do you conform to everyone else? At Morehouse, we teach you to be that man, that thermostat type man who sets the temperature, not follows it. Okay, you need to take that in. All right, I'll talk about this stuff. All right, so here we go. 